Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about some interesting home improvement products. That's what we're naming it? I haven't decided what we'll name it yet, but that sounds like a good title. Interesting Home Improvement Products. Just so you know, after every product, I'm going to say interesting. (laughs) We'd like to thank Ara Jr., for a five-star rating and review, and the Glow in the Dark radio podcast for promoting our podcast on their podcast. And we also got a couple new five-star ratings on Apple Podcasts. They didn't leave a name, but we really appreciate the ratings. I read an article in the Places Journal about the history of hardware stores. If you wanted to get home improvement products in the 17 and 1800s, you would go to your local general store, and they carried a wide range of products that the local community would need, from food to cookware, rakes, shovels, buttons, lanterns, axes, scissors, horseshoes, brooms, and flower pots. Although the early general stores didn't carry things like hinges or nuts and bolts, you'd have to go to the blacksmith and they would make what you needed on demand. In the early 1900s, hardware stores were still laid out like a general store, with floor-to-ceiling wall shelving on the back walls of the store, and then you would have counters with drawers holding the products spaced in the center of the store, and these would be like waist-high counters, Mm -hmm. and you have stuff on top of it. An article in the Modern Hardware Store book that was published in 1929... Was it a bestseller? (laughs) It showed diagrams on how to set up counters to create better flow through the store so customers could see and touch the goods to increase interest. The book also talked about grouping related items for increasing the average transaction, like merchandising brushes and steel wool by the paint, Mm -hmm. putting high-demand items like nails and screws in the back of the store so customers could see all the other merchandise Mm -hmm. that was available in the store, And they also talked about putting impulse merchandise in the front of the store. (laughs) Interesting, huh? 1929. So not much has changed. Right. (laughs) (laughs) If you've just moved into a home that was previously owned, a good project is testing all of the outlets and the GFCIs to make sure they're wired properly. Klein Tools has an outlet and GFCI tester, model RT250, that tests outlets and GFCIs. It has an LCD screen, and it shows you whether the outlet is wired correctly and the voltage. Mm -hmm. It has a green light and a red light. If you plug it in and you see the green light, you know that it's wired properly. But but if you see the red light, you know there's a problem. And on the screen, if you see that red light, it's going to show you whether you have an open hot and open neutral or an open ground, or whether the hot and ground are reversed or the hot and neutral are reversed. So open meaning it's not connected? Yeah, so on a lot of these testers, you're going to have a chart that shows problems. And whenever uh, an electrician talks about an open wire, it just means it's not connected. And this style outlet tester takes batteries, which is different from a standard outlet tester without an LCD screen. Right. When you turn on this tester, the screen is going to show open hot if it's not plugged into a live outlet because it's not detecting a live hot wire so it thinks the hot is disconnected. Another unique feature of this tester is it will let you know if the outlet that you plugged it into has a live hot wire, but an open neutral and ground. So with a standard outlet tester, if you just plugged it into an outlet and the live wire was connected or the hot wire was connected, but the neutral and ground were disconnected, none of the LED lights would light up, so you wouldn't know that you had a live hot wire unless you used another tester, like a non-contact tester. So this is another safety feature with this. Another thing this tester does, since it has a battery, is it will hold the last reading on the screen for 10 seconds after you pull it out of the outlet, which is convenient if you have outlets with the ground up, so you couldn't read the screen, or if it's sideways, the outlet, and it's against something, so it's hard to read the screen, so you just plug it in, you pull it out, and you can see what the problem is if you get that red light. Right. 
and to test GFCIs to make sure they're wired properly and the time it takes to trip the GFCI. Uh If you have a buildup of rust, uric scale, lime, and other water deposits in your toilet, you can use hydrochloric acid to remove them. I've used sand... Uric scale? Uric scale. So those are the deposits from urine. Gross. I... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I've used Santine. It's S-A-N-T-E-E-N, toilet bowl cleaner, and it does a really good job. When I owned hardware stores, this is what some of our plumbers would use to clean urinals or toilets that had a buildup of uric acid. You want to make sure if you use a product like this, you protect your eyes, hands, and face. You should, wear, you should wear gloves, goggles, and a mask, and have plenty of ventilation. What kind of mask? So either like a disposable respirator or a cartridge respirator. The key key thing is you really want good ventilation. Right. If you've used bleach cleaners, though, or have bleach cleaners in your toilet tank, never use an acid cleaner. When acid and bleach products are mixed, it produces a deadly gas. Right. When you're using a toilet cleaner with hydrochloric acid, remove as much water from the bowl as you can. I would use a plunger with a flange. Pour about a quarter of the bottle into the toilet bowl and let it set for about 15 minutes and then scrub it with a toilet brush. And make sure you're careful. You don't want to splash. Flush it. Repeat if necessary. If it doesn't remove the scale and deposits after the second time, you can use a small plastic scraper and it should break away any buildup. Mm -hmm. And I've used this on a lot of the old toilets in these homes that we remodeled over the years. And it's always done a very good job. I would usually start out with something more mild, but if they were tough deposits, then I would go to hydrochloric acid. Just be careful. Acid is dangerous. Right. If you're putting in posts for a fence or a mailbox, there's a product called Post Protector, and this is an HDPE covering for pressure-treated or cedar posts. What is that? HDPE. It's (laughs) high-density polyethylene. Thank you. Which is basically plastic. All right. So it's lightweight. It slides over your post and it creates a barrier between your post and wood destroying organisms in the soil. Mm, You seem kind of excited about this. Well, it's pretty cool because it's so simple, especially like for treated posts. It helps prevent the chemicals in the wood from leaching into the soil because you want those chemicals to stay in the post because they're poisoning the wood fibers and that prevents insects and microorganisms from infesting and feeding on the wood, right. which is the main cause of decay with posts. It has wavy sides to allow moisture to pass through and evaporate, and they come in a variety of sizes. Some have covered bottoms with weep holes. Some have open bottoms. Yeah. There was a study done with post protectors, and it showed they increase the longevity of wood posts by over 200%. Wow. I just put in a mailbox for one of my neighbors, and I used a post. Nice I've used the post protector on the four x four, and I also used a product called Sika Post Fix. It's S I K A Post Fix because our local post office doesn't want you to set the four x four in concrete. Oh really? This is a two part polyurethane expanding foam that will support fence and mailbox posts. Hmm. It comes in a bag with two parts separated by a seal. And depending on the hole diameter and the depth, you're going to need one to two bags, and they have a chart on the back. The mailbox that I replaced for my neighbor, I used one bag to anchor the 4x4 post. For the mailbox I put in, they wanted a 26-inch deep hole for the 4-foot-long 4x4, so 22 inches was above the soil. Okay. Once I dug the hole and centered the 4x4, I held it plumb in the center of the hole with a couple of stakes. They say wear gloves and safety goggles. You're going to take the bag and start rolling it up from one side, and it's marked with arrows. Mm -hmm. As you roll it, the center seal breaks, and it mixes the two parts. You want to shake the bag and mix the chemicals together for 20 seconds, and then cut the corner of the bag and pour it into the hole. It starts to expand all around the post. It starts to harden and set up after three minutes or so. It's fully cured in two hours. And they say one bag will fill the same space as two bags of concrete. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's pretty easy. If you're planning on replacing a mailbox, Simplay 3, it's S-I-M-P-L-A-Y and the number 3, they make one of the easiest mailboxes to install. 
Mm-hmm. It's called their Dig Free Easy Up Classic Mailbox. It's a plastic mailbox that you assemble, and the base holds 100 pounds of sand. You don't have to dig a hole for a post. You just level off the ground where you want to place it, fill the base with sand, and you're done. Wow, cool. It's pretty cool. So I put in one of these for my other neighbor, and I used a trenching shovel to cut the grass in the area for the base so it was flat. I poured a bag of sand on the outline I made for the base, and then I raked it smooth. I used a 4x4. I had a short piece of a 4x4. I pounded it smooth, and then I used a level on it to make sure it was level. I used a wide funnel to fill the base with sand. Make sure when you're picking out your bags of sand that they're dry, because it makes it a lot easier to pour into the base if the (laughs) sand's dry. When you position your mailbox, the post office wants the bottom of the box 41 to 45 inches from the road surface and the front of the box set back 6 to 8 inches from the face of the curb or the road edge. If you're shopping for a desk lamp, LumiCharge desk lamps have built-in phone chargers, and LumiCharge is L-U-M-I-C-H-A-R-G-E. One style has a wireless charging dock and a charging wheel with a USB-C, a micro, and a lightning connector. So this will, it, well, it reduces the cords and chargers you need on your that's desk. Nice. It has an LED light that's dimmable. It has three color modes, white, blue, and yellow. It has a night light with a motion sensor. The light bar pivots and twists, so you can put the light right where you need it. Yeah, that's nice. On the main body of this lamp, it displays the time, the date, the day, and the temperature. You can set alarms, and it has a hook and a cup for accessories. Interesting. (laughs) I think I might change the title to Cool Stuff You Can Find in a Hardware Store or a Home Center. (laughs) Yes, stuff I think is (laughs) cool. Aqua Resin Putty W is a two-part non-toxic repair putty. This is water-based. It has no VOCs. Aqua Resin is A-Q-U-A, capital R-E-S-I-N, and Putty W is just putty and the letter W. This will bond to wood, metal, rigid foam, and most hard plastics. You can use this inside or outside. For outdoor repairs, you should paint it once it's cured. It'll harden in 10 to 15 minutes after it's mixed. And it takes an hour or longer, depending on the temperature, the thickness, and the humidity, to fully cure. Once it's cured, though, it gets as hard as auto body filler. For most projects, you would mix the two parts to a peanut butter consistency. It can be shaped as it cures, and once it's cured, it can be sanded like wood. I used this on the wood siding of my house to repair a section that was damaged by water. I cut out the damaged area, and I shaped this to match the surrounding wood siding and painted it, and it turned out great. Interesting. If you have plaster walls or ceilings with hairline cracks, Red Devil makes a fiber mesh crack patch. It's a roll of self-adhesive fiberglass mesh, 36 inches wide, 75 feet long, You cover large areas where you have cracking, and then you skim coat it with all-purpose joint compound or topping compound. If you're doing a very large area like a whole wall or a ceiling, you can thin out your joint compound and use a paint roller cover to apply the compound over the mesh, and then you would pull it smooth with a wide compound knife. So it's a very easy way to repair and reinforce old plaster walls and ceilings. The Fuzi Thermo Capsule is an insulated phone case, and Fuzi is P H O O Z Y. How much do you love that name? <laughs> it's great. It comes in a variety of sizes and styles. One style has an antimicrobial lining. It uses technology adapted from NASA for spacesuits. The outer layers reflect over 90% of the heat from sunlight, and the inner layers will insulate your phone from the cold. Direct sunlight and high heat can cause your phone to shut down, shorten the battery life, or damage your battery, and cold weather can shorten the life of your battery. They say keeping your phone in the Fuzi when you're outside can extend your battery life up to four times. It has shock protection if you drop your phone, and if you drop your phone in water in this case, it floats. Cool. 
The antimicrobial cases have a permanent antimicrobial lining that uses silver ions to kill microbes and germs on your phone. After 15 minutes, it'll kill about 85% of the microbes, and after two hours, it kills 99%. It has a split ring, so you can attach it to your gear. It's good for hiking, camping, skiing, if you're on a beach or sitting out by the pool. And this is good if you're working in your garden or out on your lawn. You can clip it to a belt loop with a carabiner and run earbuds out of the case to listen to music or a podcast. Hmm. Ryobi has an 18-volt cordless high-pressure inflator, and Ryobi is R-Y-O-B-I. This will inflate almost any type of inflatable and all kinds of tires. It will inflate from 1 to 150 PSI. This is part of Ryobi's One Plus system. The same 18-volt lithium-ion battery works with over 50 different tools in their line. That's cool. This has a flexible 20-inch hose a pressure gauge on the back of the inflator. When you connect the hose to a car tire or a truck tire, it shows you the PSI, and then it shows you the pressure as you fill the tire. So Mm -hmm. it's very convenient. Comes with a needle and nozzles for balls and different inflatables. This is really handy for all your cars and trucks, and if you're going on a road trip. Right. To protect your garden against animals, Plant Skid has a ready-to-use spray repellent that's effective against elk, moose, deer, rabbits, squirrels, chipmunks, and voles. Plant Skid is P-L-A-N-T-S-K-Y-D-D. It uses dried blood from cattle or pigs, vegetable oil, and water. So it's non-toxic to people, pets, wildlife, and plants. It's OMRI listed for organic gardening. And many animals like deer and rabbits are scared of the smell of blood. It stimulates the flight response because they think there's a predator in the area. For large animals, you would spray the tops of your plants. For smaller animals, spray the lower part of your plants and the stems. And this spray can be used with their granular repellent that you would put on top of the soil. You spray the leaves of your plants until it's wet. It comes out a reddish color, so you can see what you're covering. Oh, interesting. That that color will fade after a couple of days. You're going to rinse out the spray nozzle and replace the cap, so keep your cap. You also want to spray this when there's no rain in the forecast for 24 hours. The repellent's going to be effective for three to six weeks. It's snow and rain resistant once it's fully dry after 24 hours. Hmm. With their granule repellents that you put on top of the soil, this is good for two-foot plants or smaller. It's made from blood meal, so it's a good plant fertilizer because it's adding nitrogen to the soil. And the granular repellent is good for six to eight weeks. It's snow and rain resistant. Cool. If you have to display a car sticker on your car windshield, it can be difficult to remove the old sticker when you have to replace it. Sticker Shield is a clear film that has a very mild adhesive on one side. You stick your car sticker to the non-adhesive side, and then you apply Sticker Shield to your windshield. In the future, when you have to remove the old sticker, it's just going to peel off by hand. Mm -hmm. You don't have to use a razor blade, and it won't leave an adhesive residue. This is good for parking stickers, camping stickers, and if you have to change stickers between cars, it's reusable. Oh, cool. MagVent is a magnetic coupling for your dryer's exhaust vent. MagVent is spelled M-A-G, capital V-E-N-T. One side of the coupling connects to the exhaust port of your dryer, and the other side connects to rigid metal duct, which is safer and easier to clean than flexible aluminum duct. Many people use flexible aluminum duct because it's easier to pull your dryer out, but flexible duct collects more lint, and it can get kinked, restricting airflow, which is a fire hazard. Mm-hmm. The CPSC says there are over 15,000 dryer fires a year in the U.S. because of a buildup of lint or restricted airflow. With this, the sections connect together with strong magnets, so it's very easy to pull your dryer out routinely to clean the lint, and it's much easier to clean rigid duct rather than the flexible aluminum duct. Mm-hmm. If you're switching over from flexible aluminum duct to solid or rigid duct work, you don't want to use screws to connect the sections 
because lint can catch on those screws and create a buildup, right. restricting airflow, which can be a fire hazard. Mm -hmm. You want to use metal tape or foil tape to connect the sections. What you're looking for for a dryer is foil tape with a UL181 rating. This is a flame rating for dryer ducts. It helps contain a lint fire from spreading. Mm -hmm. And a routine that every homeowner should have is cleaning the dryer duct at least once a year. Mm -hmm. X-Torch is a solar-powered flashlight, and it's spelled X, just the letter X, T-O-R-C-H. It has a solar panel on one side, so it can be charged with sunlight. You can also charge it with a USB cord. The battery can be used as a power bank to charge mobile devices. Mm -hmm. The front LEDs have two settings, a flashlight mode and a lantern mode, and each mode has two different light levels. On high, it's around 400 lumens with a 7-hour runtime. Low is around 200 lumens with a 20-hour runtime. It has a clip on the end of the flashlight, so you can connect it to your gear or hang it up in a tent, for example, mm -hmm. and put it in the lantern mode so you can have light. There's a side LED, so you can set it on a surface and use it as a lantern. And with the lantern, it's about 100 lumens, and it has two settings. On high, it runs for around 19 hours, and on low, it'll run 48 hours. Really? Pretty amazing. It holds a charge for up to three years. It has a battery life of seven to ten years, and the LEDs are rated for 30,000 hours. If you leave it out, it'll stay charged. It doesn't need direct sunlight. Hmm. So great for emergencies, home improvement projects, hiking, camping, and traveling. Interesting. Do you have anything else to add? No, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Let's wrap it up. You can subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our eBooks, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Books 1 through 13 on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can follow Cindy on Twitter, at Fixit Co-host. You can follow us on Instagram, Fixit Home Improvement. And you can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Thank you.